Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that knows Nam Chomsky is a soft revolution. He is the captain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Tonight we are drinking Psychokinesis by Grim Artisan Ales. This is a tart wild ale, dry hopped and conditioned in American white oak with notes of guava and pineapple. And you know who likes American wild ales? The great people that filled up the fridge for this week's show. And they are, first up, we have Ryan in Glendale, New York. And a big shout out to Stacy in Castro Valley, California. Next up, a big cheers to Zach and Lauren from Millville, Utah. And a big we like your jib to Tony Lynn in Morganfield, Kentucky. Next up, we have Ryan, who is a police officer up in Canada. And last but not least, Lynn in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So thank you to everybody for filling up the fridge for this week's show. We're going to go on a big beer run this weekend for next week's show. If you want to contribute, go to truecrimegarage.com. Click on the donate button. All right, let's gather around. Let's grab a chair. Let's grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Welcome back. And the bombing continues. Yeah, I know it sounds crazy as we have already covered so many instances of bombs exploding or being found and threatening letters indicating targets, but Mm -hmm. the bombing would continue. And by the start of 1952, the threat level or the terror level in New York City is at its highest. And 1952 would have its share of bombs as well, as would the years to follow. And we will go through these quickly as we have a lot to get to today. So March 19th, 1952, there is a bomb at the Port Authority bus terminal. No one is injured. In June, the Lowe's Theater is bombed. Again, no one is injured. December, a bomb exploded in the seats at the Lexington Avenue Lowe's Theater. This injured one person. Police have asked the newspapers not to print any of the bomber's letters and to play down earlier bombings because they were worried about public panic. In 1953, an explosion at Radio City Music Hall. This is when a row of seats had been rigged with explosives planted inside of the upholstery. Now this goes off. This blows up. There are no injuries. Then a bomb is found at the first Capitol Theater. Later, a bomb again exploded near the Oyster Bar in Grand Central Terminal. So this is where we see the bomber targeting the basically the exact same location that he had a long time ago. But this time he's not going to put it into an ashtray. He's going to put it into a coin-operated locker. And luckily there were no injuries when this bomb went off. Police described this bomb as a homemade product of a public-seeking jerk. Put that on your T-shirt list, there, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again. So the shirt would just read on the front, homemade product of public, wait, homemade <sighs> product of publicity seeking jerk. Yeah. Look at <laughs> what, look what you did, you little jerk. Uh, after that, an unexploded bomb was found in a rental locker at Pennsylvania Station. In 1954, a bomb exploded at the Grand Central Terminal, this time in the men's restroom, injuring three men. Well, I think what we're seeing here is he was looking for attention. That's pretty clear. The bombs weren't going off. So we don't know if he wants to hurt somebody or just get attention. But to me, my gut feeling is I'm trying to get attention. I'm trying to get attention to my cause. That's not happening. So now we're going to start seeing you know, placements of bombs where more people are going to get injured. Right. So either way, I see what you're saying there, because either way, if the purpose is to injure or kill or just seek publicity. Mm -hmm. In in fact, now he's achieving, he's achieving both of those. He's, he's injuring people, which is giving him publicity. It's almost giving him, forgive me for saying this credibility, because before we have bombs going off, 
but these things are being reported on page 28 of the newspaper. Right, which is fine, and I think he was fine with that. But once police start saying, hey, stop reporting this stuff, and now let's take the attention that he's getting and let's minimize it, that's when I think the, the bomber's going, okay, well, if you want to minimize, now it's not even on page 22, it's on page 40. Mm-hmm. you know, Or it's not even printed at all. It's like, okay, well, I guess I got to step things up a little bit. Mm-hmm. Well, after the bomb in the restroom that injured three men, someone had planted a bomb in the phone booth, in a phone booth, I'm sorry, there's probably more than one, at the Port Authority bus terminal. This bomb exploded, but thankfully no one was nearby when it went off. Now, police are having no luck finding what they've dubbed the Mad Bomber. There were hundreds of of leads, there were hundreds of tips, and crank letters uh, that they were following up on. The detectives ranged far and wide, checking lawsuit records, mental hospital admissions, vocational schools where bomb parts might be made. Right. Citizens turned in neighbors who behaved oddly, and coworkers who seemed to know too much about bombs were getting turned in as well. Now, a new yeah, group. I, the, I know a guy. <laughs> the a new group, the Bomb Investigation Unit, was formed to work on nothing but bomber leads. Mm-hmm. On November seventh, nineteen fifty four, a capacity Radio City Music Hall audience of six thousand two hundred people watched. Bing Crosby's White Christmas when a bomb that had been stuffed into the bottom cushion of a seat in the 15th row exploded, injuring four people. Yeah, this uh, story or part of the story is very confusing because they're going to take these people that got injured and they remove them, take them to first aid. and But they're basically going to just move everybody back and start the show up again. Yeah, the show must go on. So apparently... <laughs> There's the, a bomb that went off. Yeah, it's it sounds very strange. Um, and, and you and I were talking about this earlier, and we wondered if there's a chance that they didn't really have an understanding of what had happened, you know, that it was, in fact, a bomb, you know. And we also wondered... The, the injuries couldn't have been great to these people. But basically, it mm. was a show-must-go-on mentality where this this bomb goes off, And the way that the newspaper reads is that most of the people in the audience didn't hear the explosion. So they removed the injured people and then they just kind of, they kind of clear out just that little section of the theater and then start the show back up again. Now in 1955, bombs were either located or had exploded at the following locations. The Sutter, the Sutter Avenue subway station, Macy's department store, the Pennsylvania station twice in 1955, making it four times that bombs were found or had exploded at Penn station radio city music hall, making this the third time the Roxy theater bomb. And again, the paramount theater. So we're seeing places being targeted for the first time and other locations being par- targeted multiple times in December, a bomb exploded in a men's room stall at the grand central terminal. All of the incidents from 1955 luckily left no one killed or even injured. Well, it's more like sad bomber than the mad bomber. Regardless, chaos and panic had more than just set in. It had taken over. Now crazies were sending anonymous threatening letters to the police, to newspapers, and then newspaper accounts inspired copycat bombers. This really is one of the most sustained levels of domestic terrorism to hit an an American city in the 20th century. In 1956, at Penn Station, a young man had reported an obstruction in one of the toilets in the men's room. Now, the men's room attendant tried to clear it using a plunger. The 74-year-old man was seriously injured when a bomb in the toilet bowl exploded. Among the debris and the porcelain fragments, investigators found a watch frame and a wool sock. Mm -hmm, That old damn wool sock. In April of 1956, the department issued a multi-state alert for a person described as a skilled mechanic with access to a drill press who posted mail from White Plains, was over 40 years old, and had a deep-seated hatred 
for the Consolidated Edison Company. A warning circular picturing a homemade pipe bomb like the bombers was distributed. Police distributed samples of the bomber's distinctive printing and asked anyone who might recognize it to notify them. A review of driver's license applications in White Plains, the city favored by the bomber for posting his mail, found similarities in 500 of them to the bomber's printing. The names were forwarded to the NYPD for investigation. On the morning of August 5th, 1956, Police rushed to a residential neighborhood in New Jersey where a small explosion had damaged the kitchen of a three-story home. The house belonged to a man named Thomas Dorney. He's a security guard who worked at the RCA building in Manhattan. Bomb squad investigators found fragments of a pipe bomb that exactly matched the Mad Bomber's devices. A bomb exploding in someone's small home in New Jersey, this is nothing like the other attacks. Right. Detectives were thinking this must be our guy. So often captain, you will see when people are looking when the FBI or NYPD, any of these agencies, when they are seeking a quote unquote serial bomber, usually when they offer up a profile of this person or one thing that they will do in their investigations, at least is check local hospitals for people that might have injured themselves, possibly blowing off a finger or a hand because, you know, bomb making is not, it's not an easy business. It's dangerous. It's very dangerous. You could have something explode. So this looks very strange where you have, we have a small home in New Jersey out well outside of the city Mm -hmm. where this bomb goes off in the kitchen and they're now thinking this is our bomb maker. Right. Well, and he also worked at one of the buildings that there was a bomb in, right? Well, that that is that is correct, but it's a confusing story because what's interesting here is he was a guard, security guard at the RCA building in Rockefeller Center. Mm-hmm. Another guard that he worked with discovered a piece of pipe about five inches long inside of a telephone booth. Now, he comes up and he's talking with the guy about what he found the, he sees this pipe and says, look, I might find this useful later in a plumbing project. Mm -hmm. So he decided to take this item home. He said that he actually fidgeted with this item while he worked out the remainder of his shift and on the train ride home. When he got home, he put it on his kitchen table and he went to bed. Well, at some point this bomb explodes on his kitchen table and it actually injured no one in the home, even though it blew up most of the kitchen when he could have lost a hand or arm or something. Yeah. He was fidgeting with it, but his, his wife and children were in the home and they were all sleeping in their rooms well away from the kitchen. I mean, if you play with it too long, you might go blind (laughs) on December 2nd, a bombing at the Paramount theater in Brooklyn left six of the theaters 1,500 occupants injured. One of them was seriously injured. Now this drew tremendous news coverage and editorial attention. And the following day, police commissioner Stephen Kennedy met with commanders of every NYPD division and ordered what he called the greatest manhunt in the history of the police department, calling the bombers activities quote, an outrage that cannot be tolerated. He promised, quote, an immediate good promotion to whoever arrested the bomber and directed commanders to alert every member of the force to the absolute necessity of a capture. Christmas Eve, 1956, a clerk using a phone booth at the New York Public Library dropped a coin on the floor. When he knelt down to retrieve the coin, Looking up, he saw a maroon colored sock held to the underside of a shelf Mm. by a magnet. Wool sock. Yes. This Mm. sock contained an iron pipe with threaded caps on each end. After consulting with other employees, this is, I, I hate to laugh at some of these things, but when you, I hate when you laugh too, but when you look back 
and you're you're talking about things from the fifties. Mm-hmm. Like you talked about the, we found it strange that the theater, you know, the bomb goes off and then they just kind of clear out that little spot and let the sh- show go on. Yeah. I almost like picture like a little black and white movie in my mind when I'm when I'm telling these things because well listen to this they 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 see this thing and it's found in a sock they're pretty convinced that it's a bomb Mm -hmm. so what happens is this person consults with the employees at the the library and they come up with a plan let's throw this device out the window into the park they go what do you say i think we should take this uh, sock and uh with a bomb in it and we'll throw it out into the into the park yeah you see so the man that found this bomb in the sock he threw it out the window into bryant park and then they called the bomb squad bringing more than 60 nypd police officers and detectives to the scene wait one second we we have a word from our sponsor sock club a letter to the new york journal was received the next month that said that the public library bomb, as well as one discovered later the same week inside a seat at the Times Square Paramount Theater, had been planted months before they were found. On December 27th, the New York City Board of Estimate and the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association posted $26,000 in rewards for the bomber's apprehension. Two days later... On December 29th, this is at the height of false bomb reports from theaters, department stores, schools, and offices. A note was left in a phone booth at Grand Central Terminal that reported that a bomb had been placed at the Empire State Building. This required a search of all 102 floors of the landmark building. Also on this day, a 63-year-old railroad worker was picked up at Grand Central, and I could not find the exact reasoning here, but police had probable cause to detain this man for they believed he was the mad bomber. Mm -hmm. Now, this man died of a heart attack while being questioned at the East 35th Street Station house. After his death, policemen continued to investigate this man, but later the investigation eliminated him as a suspect. Okay, so you're saying that law enforcement now, to this point of the story, have killed more people than the Mad Bomber has killed. I don't know about that. I, w- I, would, put the, I would pin this one on the Mad Bomber and not the NYPD. During the month of December, because traditional means of investigation were leading nowhere, police captain John Cronin contacted Dr. James Brussel. He's a criminologist and a psychiatrist, and he had asked him for advice on how to catch the Mad Bomber. So who is Dr. James Brussel? Uh, He is a criminologist, but more importantly, a psychiatrist who had performed counterintelligence work during World War II and the Korean War. He was also the assistant commissioner of the New York State Commission for Mental Health. He has also been labeled as a Freudian related to the ideas or methods of Sigmund Freud about the way in which people's hidden thoughts and feelings influence their behavior. According to Michael Connell's book, Incendiary, psychiatrists normally evaluate patients and consider how they might react to the difficulties life throws their way. Conflict with a boss or another authority figures sexual frustrations, a humiliation at work, the loss of a parent. Mm -hmm. As Dr. Brussel read the bomber stories, he began to wonder if he could reverse the terms of the prophecy instead of starting with a known personality and then anticipating his behavior. Maybe Dr. Brussel could start with the bomber's behavior and then deduce what sort of person he might be. In other words, Dr. Dr. Brussel would work backward. Yeah, reverse engineer this. By letting FP's conduct de- define his identity, mm-hmm. his sexuality, race, appearance, work history, and his personality type. And most important, the inner conflicts that led him to this violent pastime. Quote, it was simply my own way of applying what I had learned about people 
and the years of studying and wondering, he said. And my way of taking a step on the road toward unraveling the great mystery of human behavior. Dr. Brussel called it reverse psychology. Today, Captain, you know we call it profiling. Whatever term you want to use, it was still an untested concept back in the 1950s. All right, we are back. Cheers. Chididi cheers. Hey, uh, so this is the way this thing goes down here, Captain. Dr. Brussel and the NYPD, they're going to invite several members of law enforcement to basically they're going to have an evening with Dr. Brussel where he is going to tell them what he thinks about this mad bomber that they are seeking. Dr. Bressel explains that he has examined the crime scene photo photos and letters, and he discusses the bombers metal working and electrical skills. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bressel then explains that he developed what he called a kind of portrait of the bomber and explained that he basically was leaning on his expertise as a psychiatrist and using Sherlock Holmes style hunches. Dr. Brussel's portrait of the bomber is as follows. He says FP must be a narcissistic paranoid. He deduced this from the man's manner of communication, planting random bombs, writing rambling letters, demanding justice for an unnamed wrongdoing and general attention seeking mayhem. Brussels would later write instead of admitting failings or weaknesses in himself, he attributes all of his troubles to the machinations of some powerful agency that is out to destroy him. Mm -hmm. He believed that the bomber was suffering from paranoia, a condition he described as a chronic disorder of insidious development characterized by persistent, unalterable, systematized, logically constructed delusions. Based on the evidence and his own experience dealing with psychotic criminals, Brussel put forth a number of theories beyond the obvious grudge against Consolidated Edison. He believed that the bomber would have had a good education, but probably not college. That the bomber was foreign-born or living in a community of foreign-born. The formal tone and old-fashioned phrasing of his letters sounded to Brussel as if they had been written or thought out in a foreign language and then translated into English. These conclusions based on FP's odd handwriting and the vocabulary, his use of words such as dastardly and ghoulish led Brussel to suspect that the mad bomber was probably German. Now, based on the rounded letters of W's in the handwriting, he believed these to represent breast and the slashing and stuffing of theater seats, Bressel thought something about sex was troubling the bomber. He believed the mad bomber to be a loner, no friends, with little interest in women, possibly a virgin, unmarried, perhaps living with an older female relative, probably lives in Connecticut. Now, he based this off of Connecticut at the time had high concentrations of foreign-born people. And many of the bomber's letters were posted in Westchester County, midway between Connecticut and New York City. Brussel also told detectives that a broad study of mental patients suggested that 85% probability that the paranoid perpetrator was athletic, neither overweight nor underweight, and that he would be clean shaven, tidy and polite. Regarding the physical sufferings the bomber had described in his letters, Dr. Brussel considered cancer, but ruled it out based on the length of the bomber's career and the mortality rate of cancer at the time. Mm -hmm. He considered tuberculosis, but also dismissed this based on how easy, easily treatable it had become. He settled on heart disease as being the most likely uh, physical suffering of the bomber. Bressel additionally predicted that when the bomber was caught, he would be wearing a double-breasted suit and it would be buttoned. 
Police did use this portrait to help them in their search for the bomber. In fact, they made several arrests and questioned many based off of this information, but nothing stuck. Then the news media began reaching out directly to the mad bomber. Radio and newspaper reports urged the perpetrator to call in to negotiate a surrender. Seymour Berkson of the newspaper, this is the New York Journal American, decided to publish an open letter to the Mad Bomber in the newspaper. And it read, An open letter to the Mad Bomber, prepared in cooperation with the police department. Give yourself up for your own welfare and for that of the community. The time has come for you to reveal your identity. The New York Journal American guarantees that you will be protected from any illegal action and that you will get a fair trial. This newspaper also is willing to help you in two other ways. It will publish all of the essential parts of your story as you may choose to make it public. It will give you the full chance to air whatever grievances you may have as the motive for your acts. We urge you to accept this offer. Now, not only for your own sake, but for the sake of the community. Time is running out on your prospects of remaining unapprehended. You can telephone the city editor of this newspaper, or you can go to any police station or even the policeman on the street and tell him who you are. In all cases, you will be given the benefits of our American system of justice. Give yourself up now. Well, and to the surprise of everybody, the bomber actually replies two days later. Yeah, he wrote to Journal American. I read your paper. Mm -hmm. Where were you people when I was asking for help? My days on earth are numbered. Most of my adult life has been spent in bed. My one consolation is that I can strike back even from my grave for the dastardly acts against me. Calling me names is just frustrated stupidity in action. Signed, F.P. Now, we should note, Captain, that this is an edited version of the bomber's letter. Right. He did also write that he would not be giving himself up, and he revealed uh, that he wished to bring the Con Edison to justice. He listed all the locations where he had placed bombs that year and seemed concerned that perhaps not all of them had been discovered at this time. After some editing by the police, the newspaper did publish the the letter as we read it. Right. Um, they published this on January 10th, along with another open letter asking the bomber for more information about his grievances. Now there, they did receive a second letter from the bomber in, in response to their second open letter. Mm -hmm. And this one reads as follows. I was injured on job at consolidated Edison plant. As a result, I am at judge totally and permanently disabled going on to say that he had, he had to pay his own medical bills and that consolidated Edison had blocked his workers compensation case. He yeah, stated, the, go ahead. I was just going to say he's given away too much information here. Well, he, he also stated that when a motorist injures a dog, he must report it. Not so when an injured workman, right. he rates, he rates less than a dog. I tried to get my story to the press. I tried hundreds of others. I typed tens of thousands of words, about 800,000 words. Nobody cared. I determined to make these dastardly acts known. I have had plenty of time to think. I decided on bombs were some of the things that he wrote in that second letter. He did provide details about materials that he used in the bomb, stating that he favored pistol powder. He promised a bombing truce, meaning he would leave no more bombs at least until March 1st of that year. And again, after some police editing, the newspaper published his letter this time on January 15th and asked the bomber for further details and dates about his compensation case so that a new and fair hearing could be held. Well, the bomber responded a third time. And this was received on Saturday, January 19th. In this letter, the bomber complained of lying unnoticed for hours 
on cold concrete after his injury without any first aid being rendered, Mm -hmm. then developing pneumonia and later tuberculosis. The letter added details about his lost compensation case and that the perjury of his coworkers and gave the date of this injury as September 5th, 1931. The letter suggested that if he did not have a family that would be branded by his giving himself up, he might consider doing so to get his compensation case reopened. He thanked the journal American for publicize for, for the publication of his case and said that the bombings will never be resumed. So we see he almost feels relief, I guess, or that he's received some of the justice that he thinks that he deserved just by them hearing him. Yeah. Yeah. Them listening to his complaint and then publicizing his grievance against consolidated Edison. Yeah. But this letter is not going to be published until a day after New York, please make a rest. Yes. And okay. So to get into that story, we have to introduce a wonderful, uh, dutiful woman. God bless her. This is Alice Kelly. Now, Alice Kelly is a clerk for consolidated Edison who for days had been scouring company workers compensation files for employees with a serious health problem. So the final clue came when police received a letter revealing that the date that had begun began, sorry, the mad bombers misery was September 5th, 1931, almost 10 years before the first bomb was found. Now, Brussel immediately ordered a search of con Ed's personal files from that era searching the final batch of troublesome workers compensation case files. Those, these had threats that were made or implied this Alice Kelly. She found a file marked in red with the words injustice and permanent disability words that had both been used in some of the mad bombers letters and printed in the journal American. Right. The file indicated that a one George Metesky, an employee from 1929 to 1931, had been injured in a plant accident on September 5th, 1931. Several letters from Metesky in the file used wording like the letters, including the phrase dastardly deeds. The police Mm. were notified shortly before 5 p.m. that evening. They initially treated the notification. Well, first they got a call on the bat phone. (laughs) <laughs> for the dastardly deeds. Well, they initially treated this notification as just, quote, one of a number of leads that they were working on. Mm-hmm. But they did ask the Waterbury, Connecticut police to do a discreet check on this George Metesky and the house that he lived in at 17 4th Street. Well, after Waterbury police went there, they eventually were accompanied by four NYPD detectives. And when they arrived at Metesky's home with a search warrant shortly before midnight on Monday, January 21st, they asked him for a handwriting sample and to make the letter G. He made the G, looked up and said, I know why you fellas are here. You think I'm the mad bomber. The detectives asked what FP stood for, and then the man responded, FP stands for fair play. He then led them to a garage workshop where they found his... I was waiting for something way better than that. They found pipes and connectors suitable for bombs. These were hidden throughout, as well as three cheap pocket watches, flashlight batteries, brass terminal knobs, and unmatched wool socks of Mm -hmm. the type used to transport some of the bombs. Metesky had answered the door in pajamas, and after he was ordered to get dressed for a trip to the Waterbury Police Headquarters, he reappeared wearing a double-breasted suit, and of course it was buttoned up. Mm. In the interrogation, Metesky eagerly explained everything. His motive uh, to receive compensation for his debilitating tuberculosis where the bomb making supplies were. Uh, They were in a hidden compartment inside his home. Why did he resort to bombs? He said that there was no other choice. When asked, weren't you worried that innocent people would be harmed? 
He said that I used to pray no one would be hurt by my bombs, especially on Sunday. When he was in front of reporters, George grinned ear to ear, smiling for the cameras and, in, and enjoying the uh, attention. It was a dastardly smile. Uh, he's, he's got some crazy eyes, I think. Uh, he, he looks a little, a little gone to me in some of those pictures. But it's weird because in those pictures as well with the reporters, he's, he's almost proud to be standing in front of them in handcuffs in his Sunday best. He's smiling. He he's he's kept himself up nice on his appearance for these photographs. Now, although the NYPD did officially credit Alice Kelly with turning up the clue that led to Metesky's arrest, she later declined to claim the $26,000 in rewards, saying that she had merely been doing her job. That's well, right. and it, isn't it possible too that her work could claim the reward because she was working on company time, but I, I believe they declined the reward as well. Mm -hmm. And Metesky admitted to placing 32 bombs. Now, after a grand jury heard testimony from 35 witnesses, this including police experts and some people that were injured by the bombs, he was indicted on 47 charges of attempted murder, damaging a building by explosion, maliciously endangering life and carrying concealed weapons. This would be the bombs. Mm -hmm. Seven counts of attempted murder were charged based on the seven persons injured in the preceding five years due to the statute of limitations in the case. Metesky was held at Manhattan's Bellevue Hospital where he had been undergoing psychiatric examination. After hearing from psychiatric experts, Judge Samuel Leibowitz declared Metesky a paranoid schizophrenic and stated that, quote, he was hopeless and incurable both mentally and physically mm. and found him legally insane and incompetent to stand trial. The judge committed Metesky to the, I'm probably not going to get this right here, Captain. I'll give it a shot. Go for it. Matawan. Mateawan, there we go. We'll go with Mateawan Hospital for the Criminally Insane. This was in Beacon, New York. Mm -hmm. I guess Metesky was only expected to live a few weeks due to his advanced tuberculosis, but Metesky had to, I mean, it, it was so bad he had to be carried into the hospital at this time. Then after a year and a half, keep in mind, he's, he's actually receiving treatment for this now that he is locked up. So he's receiving treatment for his illness, but he's also receiving treatment for his mental health as well. Uh, a newspaper article, this was written 14 years later. Remember, he was only expected to live a few weeks. An article written 14 years later described the then 68-year-old Metesky as, quote, vigorous and healthy looking. They stated that Metesky was a model inmate and he had caused no trouble. He was visited regularly by his sisters. He was living with his two sisters when he was arrested. Which is crazy that that was in the profile. Possibly living with an older female relative. I mean, I find that fascinating. Well, you know who else he was occasionally uh, visited by while he was there was Dr. Bressel himself. Mm -hmm. uh, to whom he would point out that he had deliberately built his bombs not to kill anyone. In 1973, the United States Supreme Court ruled that a mentally ill defendant could not be committed to a hospital operated by the New York State Department of Correction, Correctional Services unless a jury finds him dangerous. Now, since Metesky had been committed to, to this hospital without a jury trial, he right. was then transferred to the Creedmoor Psychiatric Center. Their doctors determined that he was harmless and because he had already served two thirds of the 25 year maximum sentence, right. He would re have received had he had a jury trial. Metesky was released on December 13th, 1973 with the single condition that he make regular visits to a Connecticut department of mental hygiene clinic. Now interviewed by a reporter upon his release, Metesky said that he had sworn off violence 
but reaffirmed his anger and resentment toward Consolidated Edison. Metesky returned to his home in Waterbury, where he died 20 years later on May 23, 1994, at the age of 90. Now, although Metesky's bombs never killed anyone, and he states that he built them so that they would not kill anyone, it, it was more than the police call it a miracle that none of the bombs ever killed anyone. And they stated that it was more because of strange luck that they hadn't killed anyone rather than yeah. fair play. Over all that praying he was doing. You know? Yeah. Who, who makes a bomb, sets it up? Well, they actually make the bomb so it doesn't really hurt people, but it might hurt people. Then you put the bomb into play, and then you sit around praying the whole time that it doesn't hurt anybody. Well, I think a lot of these actions are going to reaffirm the fact that he was probably, the diagnosis was correct of him being a paranoid schizophrenic. Um, According to some investigators, both the Zodiac Killer and Ted Kaczynski, a.k.a. the Unabomber, uh, were both somewhat inspired by George Metesky, the who would be known as New York City's Mad Bomber. Before we leave you today, here's a quote from George Metesky. Mm -hmm. One thing I can't understand is why the newspaper labeled me the Mad Bomber. That was unkind. Well, at least they're not sending bombs to your house, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. So, uh, we have any recommended reading. Going with a little recommended listening this week, I want to recommend to everybody a band called 2-Bit. 2-Bit is a great rock band out of Cincinnati, Ohio, and their album titled Acoustic is now available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and Amazon. If you love rock music as I do, check out one of my favorite songs of theirs. I love Simple Life. And there's also another great song called MJ Fox. So, check that out. Great band called 2-Bit. And we'll post a link on our Instagram. And if you haven't checked out our other show off the record on Stitcher Premium, you should do so. StitcherPremium.com slash True Crime Garage. And we talk about one of the band members from 2-Bit on this week's episode. But we basically do a recap of CrimeCon. And for everything True Crime, go to TrueCrimeGarage.com. And until next week, everybody, take care of yourselves. Be good, be kind, and don't let it.